Family Theater presents Gene Lockhart and Dorothy Warren Show. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Clipper Ship, starring Gene Lockhart. And now, here is your hostess, Dorothy Warren Show. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Clipper Ship, starring Jean Lockhart, as Captain Bolan. May 1849. Aboard the clipper ship Sally M, bound out of New York for San Francisco via the Cape. A fine mist dampens the leathery faces of two men standing on the quarterdeck, staring across the choppy waters at the gathering darkness. For a moment, neither of them speaks. Then the shorter and more thick set of the two rubs his hand across his face and turns to the other. I'd say we're heading right into it, Captain. Aye, Mr. McDougal, we're in for a blow, no doubt of that. Lucky it's not a cargo of tea we're carrying this time. Uh, over a passage like this, I'll take running tea back from Hong Kong till there's no more of it. A uh, ship full of gold Russian loonies <laughs> with their picks and shovels and packs of flour. Hey, there's no denying, though, Captain, the Sally M will make a very pretty penny for the passage. On this one trip, she'll pay for herself. Aye, but it's a great mistake the line is making, Mr. MacDougall, using half our clipper ships to feed this gold fever. You mark my words. In six months, the bubble will burst. Then where'll we be? We had a chance to run the British match and fleet off the seas with these clippers. Oh, dinner fast, you sell, Captain. We will yet. No, not tooling them back and forth from New York to San Francisco, we won't. And all the while, England tying up all the trade in the new Chinese treaty ports. Captain <laughs> Borland. Aye, Mr. Leckwell. Mr. Spelvin, one of the passengers, sends his compliments, sir, and would like permission to speak to you in your cabin. And who's Mr. Spelvin? Oh, you know him, Captain. I pointed him out at mess, that tall, light-haired man. He's the one that put up so much of their money for chartering the Sally M. Uh, he probably wants to tell me she's pitching a bit. And will I do something to calm the waters? <laughs> Mr. Blackwell, my compliments to Mr. Spelvin. I'll see him below directly. Aye, aye, sir. Take over, Mr. McDougall. Aye, Captain. Steady as she goes. Captain Bourne? I, well, then who are you, laddie? Oh, I'm, uh, uh, my name's Billy Downs, Captain. I'm one of the passengers. Oh. My father's Enoch Downs. He's taking me to San Francisco with him. Downs? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I, I've met him. This is the first time I've ever been to sea. Ah, then you're to be excused for not knowing that it's against the rules for passengers to be topside. Oh, I didn't know. I'll get right below, Captain. Oh, now you needn't break out all your sail getting there, laddie. I'm bound below myself. Come along with me. <laughs> I I didn't know there were any rules about being on deck. I wouldn't have done it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I just wanted to look around. Well, now, there's no real harm in that, my lad. But, well... Well, now, look. Look off to the east there. Do you see how dark the sky is? Oh, it is dark. Aye. And it could be blown on us in a trice. Water and wind like you never dreamed of. I didn't even notice how dark it was over there. Oh, and a man topside who wasn't braced and ready for weather like that, well, he might be over the rail before he knew it. Oh, I'll sure enough stay below from now on, Captain. Uh, remind the steps there, lad. Yes, this hatchway's as dark as a pocket. Yes, sir, I'll be careful. All right. Uh, well, now that's my cabin, lad, right there. Now, you just keep along this way forward and you'll get where you're going to. Say, it sounds like someone's arguing. Well, I, I'm watching if it doesn't. And the sound's coming from my own cabin. Oh, well, we'll soon stop that. Uh, belay there now. What's going on here? Uh, Captain Boland, I, I want to apologize. Well, I should hope you would, Mr. Spelvin. Go to your cabin, Billy. 
Mr. Spelvin and I have some business to discuss with the captain. Is anything wrong? Nothing at all, Billy. Go to your cabin. You best do as your father says, my lad. All right. I'll wait there for you, Father. I uh, want to add my apologies to those of Mr. Spelvin, Captain. And I find neither his nor yours acceptable just yet. Now, what's this all about? Now, uh, see here, Boland, you can save that tone of voice for your dealings with the crew. We've paid your line a fancy price for this passage. Mr. Spelvin, you listen to me carefully. And you too, Mr. Downs. I'm master of this ship, and without my say-so, your privileges as a passenger don't amount to a puff of smoke, no matter how much money you throw around. Now, is that clear? I'm sure Mr. Spelvin had no intention of questioning your authority, Captain. I'm uh, perfectly able to state my intentions without your help, Downs. Then just what are they, Mr. Spelvin? And why did you want to see me? To inform you, Captain, that a majority of the members of the company aboard have decided not to leave the ship at the Isthmus of Panama. They say they're going all the way around the horn with you. Captain, that isn't true. The majority of the company wants to cross at Panama. All up now a minute, both of you. There's no argument here. The agreement, Mr. Spelvin, is that all passengers disembark at Panama and go by mule back to the Pacific side and then ship from there up to San Francisco on the shuttle. Only the crew and the cargo go round the horn. Uh, let us say that was the agreement, Captain. It's no longer possible. Captain Boland, I assure you Just that... a moment, Mr. Downs. Now, Mr. Spelvin, I take you for a man whose word is much to be respected. Oh, look here, Boland. Uh, maybe on shore your double-tongued ways haven't caught up with you, but they won't work here. I'm telling you that the passengers can't meet the cost of crossing at Panama and taking the shuttle. That's a lie. You were given charge of the money. There was more than enough. Originally, yes. But we've had to pay nearly double for everything. I, I can show you the manifests. The manifests. And I've little doubt of that, Mr. Spelvin. But if that was the case, why didn't you make this known before we sailed from New York? And have you leave us high and dry? Or force us to sell you our cargo at a loss? No reputable line would do such a thing, and you know it. Well, if it's the reputation of your line you pride yourself so much on, Captain, how do you think it's going to look to the rest of the firms back on South Street when the story comes out in the New York papers that you stranded a whole ship full of passengers in Panama? What? what? Are you thieving, wasted? And I... that's how it will look, Captain. You can take my word for it. Get out. Get out of this cabin before I... I break you in two. Think it over, Captain. Think it over carefully. Oh, of all the, of all the slick-fisted scuds. How did any of you come to trust a man like that, Mr. Downs? I can't say about the others, Captain, but for myself, going to California seemed a chance for Billy and me to make a new life. You call chasing after gold a new life? Oh, we're not going to prospect, Captain. I'm a master carpenter. There'll be lots of work building. I've put my whole savings into tools and timber. Even so, it would have been better if you'd sent for Billy and the rest of your family after you'd got there and got yourself established. Billy's all there is to my family, Captain. Oh. His mother passed on more than a year ago. Uh, hey, well, it, it must be hard for the boy. It was, at first. But uh, planning this voyage to San Francisco seemed to take his mind, both our minds, off it. Now, I don't know what we're going to do. Well, it... Mr. Downs, you must understand. It's not out of meanness that I refuse to take you and the others around the horn. It's a grueling voyage to begin with. And then there's the matter of stores. Why, even on short rations, there's not near enough food aboard to feed 20 extra people for that long. Oh, I I'm not blaming you, Captain. You know what I think? The more I turn it over in my mind, the more I'm convinced Spelvin's still got that passage money of ours with him. Aye, and I'll go far enough along with you on that to wager that those manifests he wanted to show you are forgeries. And he's likely banking on seeing us all stranded in Panama, flat broke, and him the only person with enough money to get to San Francisco. That way he could be there first to claim all the cargo when it arrived and strip us clean. From what I've seen of him, Spelvin's not above trying such a scheme. But to prove it, mister, huh? To prove it, you'd have to lay hands on the money. I've still got a few days to Panama, Captain. If Spelvin has the money, I'll know by then. Spelvin, I want to talk to you. Do 
due right now on the quarter deck to take over from the first mate. I won't keep you. Step inside a minute. Pretty nasty night, huh? I've seen worse. What's on your mind? Did the captain say anything to you about what happened in his cabin this afternoon? I'm just the second mate, Spalvin. Boland doesn't tell me anything, except orders. You uh, heard about it, though. I heard you riled him fair enough. Would have done my heart good to see that. He threatened to put us off at Panama, no matter what. Do you think he meant it? He can lay to that. Boland says something, he means it. Good. Maybe not so good for you. The rest of the passengers in this company of yours, I hear a fair boiling over the rumor that their money's gone. There's no more rumor to it. I told them the money's all spent. We all had a meeting tonight at the insistence of that meddler Downs. I showed him those manifests you had made for me. <laughs> you never heard such gnashing and weeping. But they swallowed it. They swallowed it whole. You're a brassy one, Spalvin. I'll say that for you. Hey, speaking of brass, Mr. Blackhole, do you want your share now, or would you prefer to wait until we meet in San Francisco? <laughs> Come in. Captain Boland. Ah, oh, Mr. McDougall, come in. Come in now. Oh, it's more than a wee bit of a blow we're breasting out there, sir. I know. I'm going topside directly, Mr. McDougall. No, oh, there's no need right now, sir. Blackwell just took over. Ah. Uh -huh. uh, sir, if uh, if it's not out of turn, eh? this, this trouble among the passengers, the, the gold rushes. Yes, I... I know, Mr. McDougall. Uh, it's a pretty mess, right enough. They've been taken, swindled, most of them out of their life savings. Aye, by that, uh, that Spelvin fellow, eh? I'm afraid so. Is there not they can do? Not without proof, Mr. McDougall. Well, men like that Spelvin ought to be keel-hauled proper. Mr. McDougall, I've been wondering. You know... There's no doubt that we cannot take all of these passengers around the horn with us. But if... Yes, sir? Well, it seems to me that if they were to delegate one of their number to stay aboard with us and accompany the cargo to San Francisco to see it wasn't sold from under them before they got there... If you ask me, sir, that's a spanking good idea. Huh? Uh, who would you think would be the, uh, the proper choice? Well, uh, the... Uh, that carpenter, he knocked downs. Aye. He seems to have a firm enough head on his shoulders. Aye, sir, he does indeed. Hey, but there's that young boy of his. You, you couldn't very well be leaving him behind. Oh, no, no, no. Aye, aye, aye. We couldn't do that, of course. But it's no task signing on a little tyke of his age <laughs> for a few weeks. <laughs> He'll eat less food than Cookie's parrot. Oh, you've taken quite a shine to that lad, haven't you, Captain? Not a bit of it now. Not a bit of it. <laughs> But he's brighter than most. <laughs> Say that for the boy. Aye. And when he looks aloft to the spars and the rigging, his eyes are afire with wanting them. <laughs> but I, I don't suppose you've noticed that. <laughs> uh, you old sea serpent. <laughs> yes, yes. I've seen the look of him. And I know that look. I'd know it anywhere. He's fallen in love with the sea, like the rest of us. Eh, uh, would you... Want me to pass the word to Mr. Downs that he's welcome to stay aboard, sir. It might calm the others down a bit if they knew you decided to help them this way. Oh, no. No, you, you get some rest, Mr. McDougall. I'll do it myself. I, I feel a bit like stretching my legs, anyhow. <laughs> Spelvin, is that you? Who's that? Enoch Downs. I want to talk to you. I think we've said all there is to say to each other, Downs. I came up on deck for some air. I'd like to enjoy it by myself. Like you're going to enjoy that passage money of ours? <laughs> Don't be a fool. I'm not going to be one any longer, Spelvin. I examined those manifests very carefully tonight. They're forged. I don't suppose you'd be so foolish as to make that accusation publicly down? I would, and I will. With no proof? With proof enough to warrant an investigation. 
I've been wondering ever since this voyage began where it was I'd seen that second mate before, Blackwell. And, uh, have you remembered? With your help, yes. I was standing down on the companionway when he came out of your cabin tonight, counting a handful of silver. Well, there's no law against a ship's officer counting his money. His money? No. But my money, the money of the other passengers, money you claim has already been spent, that's something else. You mean you're going to report Mr. Blackwell to the captain? That's exactly what I mean. And I'll wager an examination of those coins will prove that... Did you hear all of what he was saying, Blackwell? Uh, enough of it. I told you there was someone watching down the companionway when I come out of your cabin. What'll we do with him? Well, there's a heavy sea running tonight. Aye. Man who was standing too close to the rail. The way this ship is rolling and pitching. Aye. Give me a hand. <laughs> Yes? Is that you, Master Billy? Captain Bolin. If your father's still awake, I'd like to talk to him for a moment. Uh, he's not here, Captain Bolin. He hadn't come back since all the passengers had that meeting. Not since then? Why, lad, that's been hours ago. I know. He was all excited when he came back from seeing you this afternoon. Uh, he had every reason to be, lad. Is there anything wrong, Captain? Father said that... Well, uh, Mr. Spillman had stolen our passage money, but... but... Now, now, Billy, ease off now. There's no sense hoisting your sheets till you know where you're bound. Uh, did your father say that he had talked to Spelvin about the passage money yet? Nobody meant to. I know that. Uh, most likely after the meeting below decks. Captain, are you going to make us all get off at Panama? What, lad? Panama? Uh, Oh, no, 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 not, not, not all of you. I told Father you wouldn't. I knew you wouldn't. Um, uh, Spelvin's cabin is this way, isn't it? Huh? Oh, yeah. It's down toward the front. I mean, uh, it's forward, sir. Forward? <laughs> You're learning the lingo, aren't you, lad? <laughs> Come along now. Forget this, Blackwell. Don't worry, Spelvin. I won't let you forget it. My price jumps about 200% for helping get rid of meddlers. <coughs> hush, lad, hush. What was that? I didn't hear anything. What are you so jumpy for? I tell you, I heard something. A rat, probably. The ship's crawling with them. Well, uh, maybe. You need some sleep. I'll see you in the morning. Yeah. Yeah, I do. Good night, Blackwell. Now, laddie, laddie, now get a hold of yourself. Oh, my father. No, no. This would have to do with me. No, now, Billy, oh, hold on to yourself, laddie. Mr. Spillman, he will kill. Lad, I give you my oath. If it's true, if it's true... Search the whole ship, Captain. There's no sign of Downs. Uh, no. <clears throat> I, I didn't expect there would be, Mr. MacDougall. Have you uh, told the boy yet? He suspects the worst already. I sat with him in his cabin until finally he fell asleep. Do you think the, the boy's father was murdered and then thrown overboard? Uh, there's no doubt in my mind. I found this on the after deck. Next to the rail. The balloon pin. Bloodstained. Aye. I've been trying to decide... To decide what, Captain? To decide whether to let the authorities take care of Mr. Spelvin, or to do it myself. <laughs> Oh, 
Well, oh, come in, come in, Captain Boland. Oh, this is quite an honor. If a bit early in the morning for a social call. Uh, won't you sit down? Ah. What can I do for you? Mr. Spelvin, I've just been having a little talk with my second mate, Mr. Blackwell. Yes? Yes. Uh, is that something that should concern me? He tells me that you are willing and able to pay for cooperation. Uh, what sort of uh, cooperation do you mean, Captain? Oh, come, come now, Mr. Spelvin. You and I are men of the world. Even the master of a clipper ship likes to turn an extra dollar now and then. I can appreciate that, but uh, just what will I be paying for? Well, uh, as a starter, I can definitely assure you that the passengers you want to have stranded at Panama will be left there. Uh, but weren't you going to do that anyhow? I might have, but this way you can be sure of it. How much? Fifteen hundred dollars. Isn't that a little high? Hardly, considering you'll have a free hand to dispose of their cargo at whatever price it'll bring. Uh, you've got a point there. I'll give you the fifteen hundred as soon as we've cleared port at Panama. No, you'll give it to me now. How do I have any assurance that You'll if I give... You'll give it to me now, or I'll see that the ship is interned at Panama indefinitely. In which case, you will have to sell your cargo to my line at a loss. Uh -huh. No reputable line would do such a thing. <laughs> well, Mr. Spelvin, do you pay me now, or was Mr. Blackwell mistaken about you? You'll have to take it in silver. Ah, well, silver is highly acceptable. Count it out yourself. I'm surprised that the rest of the passengers didn't realize they were being swindled. The rest? Yes, I, I mean, besides Downs. <laughs> that carpenter, he didn't have the sense to leave well enough alone. He didn't. Me, you talk as if he weren't around anymore. Uh, didn't, doesn't, it all adds up to the same thing. He was a fool. Was? Was, is... Ah, no, Mr. Spelvin. You said was. That's twice you slipped. Slipped? Oh, what's the matter with you? I thought we were doing business together. I have something here in my pocket, Mr. Spelvin. What do I care what you have? Uh, this is what we call a belay pin. Did you ever see one? Uh, uh, well, yes. Of course you have, Mr. Spelvin. We used them on the ship to secure the lines along the rail. And they've other uses, though. Yes? You see this straight part? It can be gripped like a club. So. Yes, sir. And used like a club, I might add. What are you getting at, Bob? A good swipe with a belaying pin. If it lands right, and a man won't know what hits him. What is this? For example, I could step around this table between us. It's not a big table. And before you knew it, lay this pin against your temple neat as you please. Oh, then what's the matter with you? And you know I'm about the only man aboard who could do a thing like that without running into trouble. Stay away from me. I could drop you like a log, Spelvin. And then tonight, when the darkness closes in, just slide you through the rails. Stop it, don't. And no one would say a word to me, Spelvin, because I'm the master of this ship. Get away! Just like you and Blackwood, the queen of downs tonight, eh? I didn't hit him, it was Blackwood. And who shoved him overboard? I didn't, it was Blackwood. Do you see this belaying pin? Don't, please! No one would say a word to me, Spelvin. I, I did Not a word, you understand? I just slide you through the rails. All right, all right, I... I, 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 I pushed him overboard, but don't... Don't hit me with that! Don't hit me! Mr. McDougall! Yes, sir. You heard him. That I did, Captain. So did I. Put him in irons. Steady as she goes, Mr. McDougall. Steady as she goes, Captain. Captain Bowen. Oh, oh, yes, Millie, yes. Do you think my father would have, would have wanted me to ship around the horn? He told me himself, Letty. It was a new life he wanted for you. Well, that's what I got, isn't it, Captain? 
a new life. You know, I... I think if he hadn't been such a good carpenter that my father would have liked to see. You know? Aye, my lad. Aye. <laughs> This is Dorothy Warrenshold again. You know, it's, it's nice to meet people who are kind and happy. Of course, it isn't always easy to be that way. <laughs> we all have our moments. Yes, and we all have the difficulties and inconveniences that sometimes get us a little riled up. But you know, that's mostly because something's been misplaced or there's something missing either around the house or in people. We kind of expect people to think of things or do things a certain way, and we're upset if they don't. But isn't it true we often get grousy and annoyed and the real reason is there's something missing in ourselves? <laughs> I guess we hate to admit that, but it's true. Yes, it's the things that are missing that make for unhappiness. And a lot of homes are unhappy because family prayer is missing. That's something worth thinking about for all of us. Because if you want a real happy home, you must have a daily remembrance of God in your home. That's what family prayer is. It's God's wonderful way to bring a family close together in happiness. That's why we believe that the family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Clipper Ship, starring Jean Lockhart. Dorothy Warrenshold was your hostess. Others in our cast were Richard Peel, Michael Hayes, Richard Beals, Lou Krugman, and John Stevenson. The script was written and directed for Family Theater by John T. Kelly, with music composed and conducted by Harry Zimmerman. This series of Family Theatre broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our Family Theatre stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theatre that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home, and inviting you to join us next week when Family Theatre will present... Blood Will Tell, starring Gene Evans. Dennis Day will be your host. Join us, won't you? <laughs> Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America. <laughs> <laughs>